I'd like to first say thank you, Arthur, and perhaps offer him a round of applause again. And I'd, I'd like to invite you and Professor Lee and Philip if to join us up front here for a brief conversation about the film. Thank you, Debbie. I guess I should just start. <laughs> Well, I, first I just want to say what a pleasure it is to be a part of this because Arthur is one of my beloved creative writing students uh, many, many years ago, and, we, and we've stayed friends, and, um, and I've seen the, you know, the progress of this, of this film over the 13 years, so it's an honor to be here with you today. So my, my, uh, I, we don't have long, so I probably will ask one or two questions, and then hopefully you guys will have some questions. But, um, so my first one is um, one of the most powerful aspects of the film is its examination of the ties and responsibilities to home. And uh, it made me think about how the home place continues to live within us, um, how its meaning shifts, how belonging there changes as we grow up and become different, making us both insiders and outsiders. And so, um, you know, what, my question is, what do you understand and what is the film saying about the challenges of balancing, of reconciling the home you came from and the new home that you're in the process of creating uh, in, in leaving it? Thank you, Helen. Um, First of all, I'd like to say thank you, everybody, for showing up and checking out the film. Thank you so much, Debbie and Kate and um, Mark and the MIT Museum and everybody who made this happen. It's a great honor to have this homecoming screening. Um, I wanted to explore this question of what is home because I felt that um, that idea or that a oh, home drifts within me. Um, over over my travels when I when I got to MIT and, and sp spent time here um, and so I was lucky you know to have um, collaborators like Philip Sante Billy and Fidelis to really explore that I think my takeaway from from the experience is we all kind of belong everywhere in the world as humans um, and and that became one of the more uh, important sort of undertones or, or meanings of the film for me, you know, whether um, as a queer uh, African, you know, there, um, there are questions about do queer Africans belong in Africa, you know, and, and then as a, as a black man in the US, um, you know, I sense all these ways in which um, American society made me feel like I didn't quite belong and, and there were reasons for me to be suspect in different situations. And so I think the film was a way to sort of assert, but, but as somebody who kind of was born in, in Europe, in the Soviet Union, grew up in Ghana, and then you know living in the US, I feel like a citizen of the world. And I, I guess I'm very skeptical of borders, having gone through the experience that I uh, have gone through and so like the film it, to me is a meditation on just how like we all belong everywhere and really should have that opportunity to to celebrate that belonging so that home can be every place um, yeah so for me it's actually something that's been hard for me to like clearly define like where is home partly because there are a couple of factors that I look at when I want to like define home. I know that I feel at home if I'm in an environment where I feel like I'm growing and I'm empowered to have the impact that I personally want to have on my family or the people that I care about. At the same time, I feel at home if I'm in a place where I feel accepted. 
Now, if we compare, let's say, Nigeria versus the US, in Nigeria, I feel very much at home because that's where my family lives. In the US, I've come over time to feel more at home here, partly because my family is here, but at the same time, even more because I'm able to do a lot of things that empower me to have the kind of impact that I want to have um, in like helping out my, my loved ones and whatnot. So that's helped me, I guess, feel more at home in the US because I can be productive here and get a lot of things done in ways that I can't get done in Nigeria. So the summary of it is I bounce back and forth between, between kind of like these two places and where I really define as home. But the common thread between, let's say, Nigeria and the US is that one thing I've learned about myself is family is very important to me. And so now that my brother is here, my immediate family is here, I feel more at home in the US. So in that sense, I would say, I guess, home is where family is. Yeah. OK. Um, well, so another question. Um, you know, Arthur, you revisited your MIT experience in making the film and, and in watching it again and again, <laughs> um, both of you, uh, and, and talking about it at events like this. You know, both of you have had that experience. And uh, it must be, you know, unique to get to see yourself in process or see yourself becoming. And so I'm wondering, what, what would you say, what would you like to say to the, your former self, you know, the self arriving at MIT and, and maybe also the self graduate, graduating, maybe those would be two different messages. What would you like to say to that, you know, er, earlier self with the wisdom you have now and this opportunity to like, you know, see your story unfold over and over again at the screenings? You know, the way I would like to answer that is, if I try to remember how I felt in the early days, you know, after that initial feeling of excitement, but then coming into MIT and feeling like I was different from everyone was a bit of a, was something that was unexpected. And so an advice I would give myself at the time would have been to not dwell too much about, on the ways in which I was different from other people and focus more on the things that actually really connect us. Because beyond how I was different, there was quite a lot that actually connected me with other MIT students, which I, get to, I got to see when I moved off campus to a place like Student House. It's this shared drive to want to really impact the world, to want to go beyond just your own immediate needs, to want to change places for the better. That's this drive to pretty much want to be excellent. It's this common feeling that a lot of people share, like as you take these difficult classes and you're trying to perform well, like this grind that people go through day in, day out to stay on top of their work. So over time, I guess, after my, by my second and third year, I felt more at home. Um, I wasn't looking at MIT through this lens of how it's different from everyone anymore and felt more, um, like I shared a lot more in common. So I guess the advice would have been what I would have given myself in that first year to not dwell too much on differences and focus more on what connected me with other people. Yeah. Um, I guess the advice <laughs> I'd give myself is don't drop that class <laughs> that you dropped because you were making a B. <laughs> because I retook it and then still got a B. <laughs> so I think that would be it. I, I think, you know, Maybe to extrapolate from that is you're pretty great. Um, uh, you'll do really cool things. Um, so don't be so hard on yourself, you know? Um, and I think, you know, that maybe a lot of MIT students can relate to that. Do we have time for, I don't know where we are with, yeah. Okay, uh, I guess another thing I was interested in is um, having seen an earlier iteration of the film, I was struck by how it was transformed when you became a character, you know, the, the fifth subject uh, of the film and included your personal experience. And I don't know, can you speak to that? Like, what was, was that difficult? And, and what was that, you know, decision like and the, the, the feeling of becoming, of stepping into the, the frame? Yeah, so, um... From the very beginning, I thought, you know, my experience would be sort of the motivation, you know, the questions that I was curious about 
after having gone through MIT and lived some years in the US, would be the motivation for the film, but would not be a part of the film that you would see, right? So sort of, if you think of an iceberg, the part that's submerged. And you know, Philip's story, Sante's story, Fidelis' um, story, and Billy's story would be the main film. And so it took us five years to edit, and for a long time, it was that film. And something wasn't really quite adding up. <clears throat> um, and, but then there were always these moments in the film or in the footage that were sort of the messier bits, like you know, the moment where Fidelis grabs the camera and starts filming, <laughs> filming me, or uh, you know, conversations that would have across, you know, where you know the quote unquote film subjects are not being nice film subjects and they're like challenging me or having discussions um, across the, uh, the the fourth wall of the lens. Um, there were moments; th those moments were kind of drawing attention to them, some they, to themselves. They had an energy, and there were things about them that felt resonant or like important. Uh, but it took me a while to figure out how they belonged in the film. And it really was um, in 2021 uh, when Ghana introduced, Ghana's parliament introduced the anti-LGBT bill, this horrible um, hate bill that actually they, they just a couple of weeks ago voted to become law. And you know the final step is for the president to sign it. There's a couple of challenges to it in the Supreme Court on technicalities. But if this law based, if this law actually takes effect in Ghana, which it could very well do, um, just by saying that I'm gay, I can be thrown in jail for three years. Um, my family for not reporting me could be thrown in jail for years. Any organizations wor working with queer folks um, could be thrown in jail for, for five years. I mean, it's just so outrageous, um, <clears throat> and so on and so forth. So in 2021, the parliament introduced this um, as a bill, and actually there were other things happening, like 22 people got arrested for having a paralegal training for queer people, um, and then they kept getting denied bail over and over again. So, you know, lots of them lost jobs, and. Um, had issues with family because they were outed and things like that. So anyway, there were horrible things that were happening, um, and I, I, and and the the diaspora, the queer Ghanaian and African diaspora, were trying to figure out a way to like support the movement and the the push against this bill. And so we started protesting. So you know, we saw one of the protests, a little bit of it in in New York. Um, but it made sense because, oh sorry, it made sense to include myself because finally I realized that my story about um, sort of searching for home and maybe getting estranged from Ghana, my, my country of origin, was a different flavor of the story that we were telling through Philip, Fidelis, Sante, and Billy. Um, and it seemed urgent to include that as well. And so, you know, it became, I embraced that also because I realized that they had been a very vulnerable and they had shown me the power of vulnerability. And so it felt right to sort of match their vulnerability by opening up and, and sharing my own story in a very vulnerable way as well. So anyway, that's how that came to be. And then um, Kelly Creedon, my final um, editor for the film, really helped us figure out how to integrate the voiceover with, you know, with the rest of the footage. And so that was pretty special. We, any questions from the audience? Okay, well, thank you. Um, Arthur, this is brilliant. Um, the subject you're just talking about, I'm so sorry to hear what's going on in Ghana, but is that what made you change the name of the movie? Remember once upon a time, it was, yeah, one day two. Thanks, Bob. Uh, so it used to, originally the film was called One Day I To Go Fly, and um, that's not why I changed the film, the title of the film. It became brief, tender, light because um, there were a couple of years where I was editing the film myself because we didn't have funding to hire a real editor, um, and in that time I was trying to figure out the structure of the film. You know, there are four lives. Uh, that's another five. You know. Being, being portrayed in the film, multiple years, four, five countries that we travel to, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> it was pretty complex. 
Um, and I happened to listen to uh, a masterclass given by uh, an editing consultant for documentaries. And he spoke about how even in, in any film, fiction or documentary, even if you have multiple characters, you can only have a single protagonist. And hearing that actually lit a bulb in my head. And I realized that the single protagonist, the unified protagonist in my film was um, youthful idealism. You know, my central question that I was chasing was, or investigating through this film was, can youthful idealism survive the process of growing up? Can it mature into something that's actually useful? Because young people believe, you know, like the sky's the limit, we can do anything, um, anything is possible, we can change the world. But then as you mature into adulthood, there are all these pressures that, that creep in, whether it's, you know, racism, or whether it's like, um, you know, the pressures of like, you know, providing for your family, or you start your own family, and so on and so forth. Um, or you, you come out and you, know, you have more freedom uh, or safety in the U.S. versus home. So there are all these things that kind of test that youthful idealism. And so it, the film needed a new title to sort of tie that idea together. So that's how it became Brief Tender Light of Youthful Idealism, which is a mouthful, and so Brief Tender Light for short. Wow, that was amazing. Um, I'm curious how you first conceived of the idea to do this, to start filming people from their freshman year and following them through, and what you thought the film was going to be when you started, and that did that change over time? Thank you. Um, I went to film school because I always loved storytelling. You know, I took a lot of classes at MIT. Actually, that's how I survived MIT, I think. The writing classes were my, you know, um, my relief. Let, um, me, let me say, he was a brilliant short story writer as well, so hope, I hope that's still, you know, maybe you're, you're going to write some stories or novels, I'm hoping. I haven't written short stories in a while, but maybe it's time to get back to that. Thank you, Holly. Um, so anyway, I went to film school for a couple of years, um, fell in love with documentary there, and when I was stepping out, um, you know, I reached out to my host family from my MIT days who are in the house, as is my, mo my mom. It's her, and that's my mom and my host family, Helen and Greg. <clears throat> um, you know, my mom shipped me off in the flight back in 2000 to bring me to MIT. And Helen and Greg met me at the airport and drove me to MIT. And we became really good friends over the years. And you know, we've been in each other's lives. Um, we're all family now. Um, and when I was leaving film school, I you know, told them, you know, fall in love with documentaries. If you have any ideas for a documentary, let me know. So they were in LA, and we had brunch. And they said, remember the time we dropped you off at MIT, and you stepped out and said, my first step at MIT, and we've watched you go through all these interesting things in your life. What, what about a film about the international student's experience? And so, again, I was like, brilliant, you know? Because it really connected with a lot of the questions that my friends and I, international students, African international students, had been kind of musing about, you know, reflecting on about our experience, what it meant for our homes, for the US, for ourselves. And so that idea really connected, you know, so, we joke about how you know it's their fault that this film exists, but <laughs> that's how that came about. Um, and I'd say the main change is the fact that um, you know my story is included as well. Thank you very much. I enjoyed the movie quite a bit. Um, my f question is more for Philip. So the movie is about this conflict of youthful ideals you may have had when you came to the US and then um, the conflict with adapting to the US and, and evolving here. Do you feel the relationship or perspective of the people in Nigeria on you changed as well? So my, whether my perspective on Nigeria? Sorry, the, the perspective of people, yeah, the movie was more about you, but did the perspective of people in Nigeria change on you as well, like maybe of your your, your mother or friends from back home? Okay. Um, 
let's say, if I look at it from the perspective of our immediate community, since that's where uh, enough people knew me, knew of our family, and I could maybe see if there was any changes, I would say that people feel very inspired by my family story at this phase. That's like the main thing I've seen over the years. People are at this, it's almost at this point where I don't want to use the word like local celebrity or whatever the right expression is to use, but a lot of people feel very inspired that we grew up in the environment that we did, and we, I was able to come into the US, go to a school like MIT, graduate, get a job, and positively influence my home and make things better. So um, that's, I guess, the only, like the change in perception that I can talk about, like mostly positive things. And you know, with that positive perception comes expectations too. People are expecting that now that I'm here, now that like some of my family, my, my brother is here in the US too, that we would continue to sort of extend the, um, the good things that come with this opportunity to other people as well. And so we constantly actively think about that, think about ways in which we can also help like younger people who were maybe at our age when I, I got inspired to go the extra mile beyond whatever I was doing at the time that, that made me, put me in a position to get into a school like MIT. So concretely, that would mean things like maybe sponsoring other people's education, making sure that they go to better schools to get access to better opportunities. I wonder if um, Helen or Arthur, you have any concluding words as we uh, close out this program tonight. Well, again, I want to echo my you know, thanks again. Thank you very much, Debbie, Kate, Mark, um, the MIT Museum, the Council of Arts at MIT, um, the community that has supported the film throughout the 13 years. Several of you are here, you helped fund it, you helped push it. Um, I could not have done it without you, we could not have done it without you. I just wanna say thank you very much for um, making this very special thing happen, the film as well as the screening, it's a great honor. Um, I do wanna say we have sign-up sheets if you wanna get on the newsletter um, to help you know hear about future events. Um, and yeah, thank you. Uh, the film is available on PBS through April 14th. So tell your friends about it. They can stream it for free. Um, anything else? Oh, after April 14th, I believe you need to have the PBS passport, which is like a paid membership or something, in order to be able to access it, I think. Um, yeah, we haven't figured out the rest of the distribution for the film, but we're working on it. <laughs> Good question. Writing some things and yeah, trying to figure out the answer to that. Yes. <laughs> short, short stories. Short stories. <laughs> short stories. <laughs> or a novel. Yeah. Anyway. Well, this has been a wonderful evening. It's a very special film. It's um, for those of us that teach about MIT, this will definitely become part of the canon. And I'm grateful to Philip and your colleagues who were in this film and how generous you have been with sharing really intimate moments and sensibilities uh, during your time here at MIT. And we hope that all of you come back. Um, we wanna thank all of the audience members for coming tonight and sharing this film experience with Arthur, with his family. We are so grateful and honored that you all could be with us tonight. And for those family members who are far away, we're thinking of them too. I wanna thank you for coming and we look forward to seeing you at future MIT Museum events. Thank you, Helen, for doing the Q&A.